Hey guys, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of the podcast. Today, we go over the mysteries of Dynasty Fantasy Football and how our draft went. And then we talk about preseason winners that we had so far at least. And then just finish things up with the Jonathan Taylor trade speculation. So come on, sit tight, enjoy the show. Welcome back again to our fun little podcast that we got here. Uh, how are you doing, Josh? I'm doing good. Um, not as a White Sox fan. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of change. It's been a really bad season. Um, hopefully, the president and GM changes are made for the better. So we'll see about that. But I'm chilling. Otherwise, I'm really enjoying football. Um, like there, we have a couple of fantasy football drafts that we're in together that we're um, really excited about. We just did a dynasty draft. We'll talk about later uh, about that later. But um, I'm really excited for the season. There's a lot of like insights I've seen over the preseason. Can't wait to share them all with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, uh, we're gonna talk about our dynasty draft that we just did, and um, dynasty is kind of slowly growing into more, I guess common way of doing fantasy football these days i feel like you know 10 15 years ago maybe not too many people are talking about dynasty but now i feel like i know a couple people that are in three or four dynasty leagues and so uh we started one we have a couple friends in there and then we just finished our draft and so yeah we thought it'd be fun just to talk about some of those results and then after we do that uh we're also going to talk a little bit about some of the key takeaways we got from the preseason um obviously you know all this i just said this earlier but Anyways, yeah, I want to kick things off with our dynasty draft results. <clears throat> and I guess to preface this, we did do a slow draft, which means everybody got quite a lot of time to make picks. Sometimes it, it felt a little too long, but uh, we did get it done in just about a week. But um, I guess, Josh, do you want to start off kind of just talking about some of your draft strategy or like players that you're maybe really eyeballing? throughout the draft yeah um i'll admit i was i was a little frustrated at the end of that draft because (laughs) um i i believe we did like eight hours to pick and then like once it hit like 11 o'clock we just like paused the draft so a lot of times it was like waiting a couple hours just to see like where uh, people would go um but my team was young blood scorpion um you'll see it with the scorpion logo on the football helmet so i started off as pick seven um for each round and in a snake draft, I'd be, um, I'd be like round four, I mean, sorry, round two pick four. And I went from there. So as you can see, I started off with Jamar Chase as my first round selection. Um, if you've been listening to this podcast, like Jamar Chase is probably my favorite receiver, um, have him higher on boards than others. So I could have gone Cooper cup here. I could have gone, um, a quarterback because the format was super flex. So, um, uh, what Superflex means is you'll start two QBs on your roster, so there's a higher priority on them, which is why you see like almost like eight QBs get selected in the first round. Um, so that was that was an interesting approach I took. I would have liked to have a running back within the first three picks, but I think the way the board fell, I was really happy to get Jamar Chase and AJ Brown my first two picks. And once I looked at like round two like pick six and seven i noticed there were like a a lot of like elite players um i could have picked uh pick chubb uh, where i traded up to at my round two pick 10 selection but i chose to pick stefan Diggs to kind of maximize my advantage with the win now receivers i selected um so jamar chase aj brown stefan Diggs. i all think they're top 10 receivers and they could all belong in a list of top five receivers and i would have no argument with that so I was thrilled to land all three um, in my first three picks, two being in the second round. Um, and the reason I was able to pick two players in the second round is I actually traded my third round and fifth round picks um, for Stefan Diggs. And then I ended up also trading, I believe, my seventh and my ninth round picks to move up for a fifth round selection um, because I didn't have a fifth round pick at that time. And I noticed TJ Hawkinson was falling farther than like Mark Andrews and Kyle Pitts. 
So Hawkinson, I valued as my number two tight end um, in this whole draft. So I I would I wanted to pick him um, right where he was and didn't want to miss him out like and wait like a extra round or two. So I'm really glad I ended up with that selection. And I think it made up for not having a third round pick, my original fifth round, my sixth and my seventh. Um, and then I went back in the draft in um, the ninth round pick, and I traded back for Cam Akers because I noticed a lot of the other teams had running backs. I still had not. So it was probably likely that they would take other positions so I could gain some more value from that. So, so for the front half of the draft, I really tried to pick guys that not necessarily were younger, but guys that can win now and are going to be there for two or three years to give me a chance to compete for a title. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that. And I know you talked to me a little bit earlier about how you wanted to structure your team and the importance of these win now guys. And then if, you know, it sucks, well, you end up with a top draft pick, which I thought was, it's a decent strategy. Um, But yeah, I was kind of worried that you weren't taking a quarterback so early, especially I feel like, uh, the Dak Prescott and C.J. Stroud, <clears throat> plus, I guess, Derek Carr that we can see on there is kind of a big gamble to have in terms of uh, high-level quarterback play because, I mean, there's obviously – I mean, they've had great games before, but there's always question marks, I think, around those three players, especially just one of them being a rookie um, <clears throat> that is on a very much rebuilding team right now. And so um, if they don't pan – I mean, my team's kind of risky with quarterbacks too, but um, I just took them a little bit higher. But yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. Like Dak Prescott had a bad season last year by like Mm -hmm. many people's standards. Um, So I think I also traded up for him, I think, or like maybe. Oh, no, I traded back in the sixth round um, to get him because Mm -hmm. I noticed a lot of people in the draft didn't weren't high on uh, Dak Prescott. So I'm like, okay, let me collect some more value while I'm at it. And I still get to pick Dak Prescott because I didn't have a quarterback at that stage. So Mm -hmm. you're right. You're right. My quarterbacks are definitely weaker. Than, than almost every other team right now, um, except maybe one, I would say. Um, I think I'm like arguably on par with quarterback play. So mm-hmm. I really tried, like, it's a balance between like really emphasizing that receiver advantage I clearly have in the first three picks and then trying to get the quarterback play. And if Dak never like rebounds, then I have a shot with CJ Stroud developing to a really good quarterback. And I'm really high on Derek Carr in the Saints offense because um, I think I think they're going to do some things this season. So, like, I am I think I guess I was not, like, trying to put all my eggs in one basket, C.J. Stroud being my second quarterback in the starting lineup. And I'm saying, okay, if I start out with, like, Dak Prescott and Carr, that's not the worst thing in the world because they're experienced veterans um, on with good pieces around them as offensive pieces. So they can easily put up 300 yards on any given Sunday. Um, but – Talk to me about your roster because I see you um, you ended up picking at the 10th position in this draft. And that's Mm -hmm. a tough spot to be in, especially in the super flex, because you don't know how the quarterback um, strategy is going to play out here. But talk to me about how you structured your roster. Yeah. So I guess going into this, um, you know, going after quarterbacks is pretty important on my list. I mean, you see, I take three quarterbacks in this first section of the draft, two of them uh, being my first and my fourth round pick. Um, I guess a big part of this as well was just drafting players that I thought were young, that had elite upside. Um, so, I mean, we see that, you know, with Justin Fields, a quarterback that we are hoping, you know, develops better as a pass for this upcoming season that also has thousand yard rushing upside with, I mean, just scoring in general, which is pretty nice. Uh, you follow that by, follow that up with CD lamb and Chris Olave, which I thought were, Two pretty solid receivers that I was I was really excited to get here. I think both those guys are like in my like top tier of receivers. I think Olave's probably at the back end of my you know elite receivers going or elite young receivers uh, <clears throat> going into this upcoming season where you have or I think CD Lamb is probably that third or fourth best uh, young receiving talent in the league right now. I mean we've seen him play phenomenal football over the past year and so. I was pretty excited to, you know, have Justin Fields, CD Lamb, Chris Olave, and Bryce Young as my top four. Um, and then I'm because I was looking for that, I guess, elite upside. I didn't really go super far or go super heavy with running backs at all. It was mostly receivers and 
uh, quarterbacks here where, you know, I, I mean, I got Najee Harris in the fifth round, but then the next running back I take is in the 10th with Aaron Jones. Um, and with Aaron Jones, I know he had a low touchdown season last year, but he's still relatively efficient as a runner. And I thought that he'd just be a solid veteran point getter, you know, to have on my team. If I'm having a good scoring season or if I'm, you know, if I'm really competitive this year, it'll be nice to have him as kind of a key staple running back because the running backs at that point have kind of started to really thin out. Yeah. And that was the, the key to balance. I, I know I picked Eckler in the fourth round. Um, um, yeah, he was like probably the best player on the board at that time. I could have taken Cup, um, but I think the state at where I was in receivers, I think my advantage was exacted. And there are a lot of guys I really liked in the back end of the draft at receiver uh, that could develop into like guys, maybe like a Drake London or Jordan Addison, like who were really high on, like those could develop like it. Um, but I just thought I could pick them later in the draft and be confident there at the stage I was at in the fourth round. But I love Lamb and Olave, your selections, and I love your quarterbacks. Your top four is probably, like, really strong um, as far as quarterback and receiver go. Like, those are going to be staples for five years at least. Um, and I would put Olave up there as, like, as far as one of the elite receivers. And I think it's fair to put him in the back half right now because he's only had one season. Mm -hmm. But, like, he – like he may missing Michael Thomas not be like a deal breaker for the Saints last year on offense. Uh, and despite all the turmoil they had in the quarterback spot. And um, I ended up picking the other receiver later on in the draft. You'll see on the Saints and Michael Thomas as a bet. But I would have been, if I had a third round pick and a lobby was still on the board, I would have probably considered taking him. Um, but I traded up for Diggs at that point. But Alave on the third round pick, no complaints there. He's he was my top receiver in the um, 2022 draft class, so don't blame me there. And I think pretty, I'm pretty sure CD Lamb was at the top of my list for when he came out in 2020 in the NFL draft. So solid selections there. And I think Najee Harris is one of those guys who's underrated because of the surrounding cast over the couple uh, past couple of years. I know you're going to talk about Kenny Pickett much later on, but I think. No matter like how much Jalen Warren like feeds into that um, running back room, I still think Najee Harris has the capability of being RB one um, because he's that talented of a back. So, um, great job on your first five selections. Well done. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> did you want to talk about like any of the young receivers you had and like the six through eight, or would you rather go for the uh, back? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about that. Okay. Um, I mean, like I said, my strategy was going those high upside really young players and so i got you know christian watson Jahan dotson and say flowers all year one and two type guys um with christian watson i wasn't super high on him last season but i felt like he was a good value young receiver at the spot that i took him here <clears throat> and <throat> like i was i was debating between him dj Moore, and jerry judy at the time and i'm like you know christian watson if Theoretically, you know, if Jordan Love pans out as like a superstar and Christian Watson is the big deep threat, I, it's, it's a nice guy to have there. And he, he had a, quite a bit of touchdowns. He started out slow. He finished off strong, which ended up selling me to get him. <clears throat> Similar to uh, with Jahan Dotson, um, I'm pretty sure every time he was like healthy on the field, he was averaging more points than Terry McLaurin, who I thought was already a super nice piece to have. I mean, I didn't get him out. He went like just a bit before that. but he was averaging just a bit more than Terry McLaurin. So I thought, you know, he could be potential top receiver of his class, which I was really excited for. And then Zay Flowers, um, I know he has elite, you know, route running skill, which I really liked. And um, that's what, you know, led me to draft him. I thought he fell moderately low in terms of um, just young receiving talent. I know a lot of other receivers went anyways, but I really liked the value there. And then Kirk Cousins, I just thought was a safe, quarterback scoring option in case Bryce Young starts off a little bit slow, which I'm assuming he will. Right, right. And I think we have a similar we have a similar perspective on this with the quarterback play, like um taking our third quarterbacks. So I think the same reason it's the same reason why I took Derek Carr. Um but well stated and I'm receiver I think you rounded out like your top five receivers really nicely. Um mm -hmm. like like Zay Flowers I'm really high on from the draft. 
Christian Watson, I had him in my league last year, and he was an absolute revelation. I was never high on Romeo Dobbs because he was inconsistent with catching the ball to me. And I thought Christian Watson had some moments where he showed more than catching the ball. Like he separated from Patrick Peterson, but he wasn't able to hook the ball in from that Minnesota game early on in the season. And I was like, wow, if he could just like catch the ball with his like fingertips, like how he has in college, then like sky's the limit on him. And there, I'm going to talk about a play later on um, mm-hmm. uh, in the preseason I saw from Jordan Love to Christian Watson, but he, I, I see him as the wide receiver one on that team, even though I was, I talked lonely about Jaden Reed, who's on the Packers as well. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, I think Watts is in a great situation, has a lot of room to grow. And Jahan Dotson has the same thing. He could easily overtake Terry McLaurin, as good as Terry McLaurin is right now. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm going to uh, go and shift over to the back half of the draft so the viewers can get an idea of what we value at depth here. So, um, okay. You can go a little yeah, lower. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm going to talk about Cam, Cam Akers a little bit. Okay. Um, I traded back for him because um, I thought I can get him at a later time with the way uh, a lot of teams were prioritizing wide receiver and quarterback in the draft. So I traded back with my ninth round spot and also to add more value um, later on in the draft for depth. Um, but I will go lower. Uh, I think we talked about Carr. Um, I think this is right. Okay, right. perfect. Okay, right. Perfect. So, um, I did a little bit of tinkering with my drafts. Um, Joe Mixon, I had picked up because I, my only other running back, I think, was Austin Eckler at the time. So, um, to have a starter this late in the draft, I thought was a huge plus. And then uh, because the off field concerns, he fell. So I'm like, okay, let me get a chance at him because even if he's suspended, I can get some starting value out of him this season. And then I had a lot of young guys, as you could see, for like 17 um, through 20, with the exception of Raheem Moser and Jeff Wilson, who I traded trade ba- um, trade back from an earlier pick to get. Um, and I kind of balanced out my running back room that way with a lot of like young rookies and second year players I'm high on. So I'm really high on Spears and Evans. You guys heard me talk about both of them and they're in leading up to the draft. Um, I'm really high on Chico Pacquo as a second year tight end to break out because he's a starter on his team. He had a lot of, um, he had like a lot of great targets where he showed his speed. Um, and a lot of targets he was getting was like intermediate routes. Um, and that's going to be so valuable, especially when you have Hopkins and Traylon Burks. Um, and unfortunately for Traylon Burks, he's been dealing with the injury bug. Um, so like if that, if that continues to persist then Chico Pacquo suddenly becomes a second option in the passing game and I'm starting to like what I'm seeing from the tight uh, Titans lineup in, in that sense. Um, yeah. I talked about Michael Thomas. It's just a fly. Of, like I baked in the injury at the spot and I was just like, okay, he's my fourth receiver in my starting lineup. When I have Jamar chase, AJ Brown and uh, Stefan Diggs, he's going to add a plus to my team. Um, so yeah, that's, that's that that was my mindset going into like <clears throat> rounds 11 through 20 it was mostly to make up the difference in the lack of running backs i've had later on but mm-hmm. definitely looked for like some high upside guys and like veterans that were written mm-hmm. off a little bit yeah <clears throat> yeah i think i liked the strategy i mean i feel like everybody's drafted pretty well but right. yeah i think you got <clears throat> you got some really good value there i like yeah, your value with Joe Mixon. I, there's a lot of question marks around him, but like as we're doing the draft, and so <clears throat> I know that was a good pick for you that ended up with that. And then uh, I really like Akonquo. I have him in another dynasty league and uh, <clears throat> expecting big things from him. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I guess continue with my draft though. I, you know, continue to try to get players that I believe in their upside, whether or not it's proven right now. And so you see that with me trading up. Uh, to get Zach Charbonny from the Seahawks um, in this first round trading away. And then, uh, yeah, I gave up two picks, you know, tried to, to move up to get him. And right now I don't know how much of a role he'll have, but um, just in the past looking at the Seahawks when they've had two, you know, strong backs, they've been able to sustain both of them in terms of fantasy. And so I figured that, you know, with Kenneth Walker and Zach Charbonny, I think that 
both of them can be good enough to sustain both fantasy relevant players. And so that's why I banked on Zach Charbonnet back here and traded up for him because I was scared of him going. And you see, you know, right after Kendrick Miller gets drafted, then you get Joe Mixon, then Dalvin Cook, and then Rashad White is taken. And so a lot of running backs went right after I took him. And so I was pretty glad I got him there. But um, yeah, another guy I liked was Mike Evans. I thought that he was a pretty solid value to take in the health round here. Um, I don't know how much left he has of like super high end play, but he's been averaging a thousand yards a season. So it's like, you know, I mean, if he still averages around that thousand yards, it's, it's basically like that Brandon Cooks level of play that you want. And, um, I mean, Mike Evans was a league winner last season with his crazy, what, like three touchdown, 300 yard. I don't know how many yard game that he had at the end of the season, but I know he won a lot of leagues last year. And so I was like, you know, having a guy that has that type of potential, Count me in on that. So I took him there. Uh, and then I went with a couple of rookie tight ends here. I got Michael Mayer and I got Luke Musgrave. Um, a lot of the tight ends I was looking at earlier kind of just was taken just before I wanted to go for it. I know I was looking at like Kyle Pitts was the guy I was really high on that I wanted to get. And he got taken just before I was going to take him. And so I was like, oh, I'll just, you know, let the board let the board fall to me and kind of see a guy that I like. And so that's how I ended up going with Michael Mayer and Luke Musgrave. Guys, I also wanted was Cole Komet or Greg Dulcich, but missed out on them. But um, And then, I mean, you see with the running backs here, I, again, take really young guys that I think could have pretty decent upside. So you see that with, you know, uh, one, it's like four, I think I took four rookie running backs in the screen right here with Zach Charbonnet, Chase Brown, Israel, but right. Benaconda, and Sean Tucker, which <clears throat> I'm not thinking. I, I Probably three of the four of them aren't going to be good at all, but – I'm just like, you know, if one of the four turns into a top 15 back, I think I'll be happy with the value that I got here in the draft. But um, that's kind of how I was looking at the board. Plus, the receivers are just more so guys that I think can score now that may that I may need in case the younger guys that I drafted ahead of time uh, need some more time to develop. Yeah, um, and I love that approach with rookies because you've seen like Isaiah Pacheco just blow up. Elijah Mitchell has in the past, like over the season. So you're kind of like hitting the lottery here with like four backs and like hoping one of them pans out. Charbonnet, I think we're both high on him as like one of the best backs from out of the draft. Like he's probably, I think it was like top five in my rankings. Um, if I were to rank rookie burning backs, um, Israel Abanikanda, great talent out of Pitt. Um, He's in a crowded situation right now um, with the addition of Dalvin Cook um, and Beast Hall obviously coming back. But, like, anything could happen over the course of the season, and you could find yourself, like, starting Israel Banacanda. Just look at Zonovan Knight from last year. Um, He started out of the blue, and he performed well. So, like, in that Jets offense led by Aaron Rodgers, great selection there. Um, I, I took a couple of, like, second-year players that I think that were overlooked. I think Trey McBride was a huge tight end that was overlooked for experienced drafters, I think. Um, I, I think I had traded up to get him. Or, no, no, I had traded back from an earlier pick, I think. Um, but either from the the Hawkinson trade or maybe, like, the Zach um, the, um, Cam Akers trade. Um, and I got Trey McBride. I think he's in for a huge future like on the Arizona Cardinals. Um, obviously, if you watch our NFC West podcast, none of us are high on the Cardinals. So <laughs> if he ends up in a situation where Caleb Williams or Drake May is throwing him the ball, I think that his future is like insanely, insanely high. Um, and I also think Keontae Ingram was like another guy, like backup running back who's overlooked um, because he's like a lesser known household name. Um, he's behind James Conner. James Conner is not... Uh, been able to stay healthy the past couple of seasons. Um, and he's out, uh, always missed a couple of games. So um, I think Keontae Ingram proved, to, um, proved he can play in the league like last year as a rookie. And I think he's also like in a good assurance. And I think um, I was happy to get Mostert and Wilson, my two bigs back to back. And Wilson was another pick. I had uh, traded back from a er- much earlier pick and got a 19th round pick as a value. So taking both the uh, uh, top two backs in Miami is definitely huge. Mm-hmm. Um, any any guys like towards the end of the draft? I know I'm only showing uh, round mm-hmm. 22 or round 26. 
real quick that you think um, were huge for your team that um, you're you're just like you're really confident in them, even though it's like a clear late round flyer at this stage. Um, I really liked, I guess Jake Ferguson and Trey Palmer here. Um, okay. Yeah, Jake Ferguson. He apparently he's had a really good camp. He's done decently in preseason, and so I think. I don't think I don't know about his long term value here. I think Luke uh, Luke Shoemaker uh, surpasses him in like a year or two, but I do think that Jake Ferguson will be a pretty decent starter for this Cowboys offense for the next year, maybe two years. And I was like, you know, if he can start for two years and let my other rookies develop, uh, and then I face him out, I think that'd be a perfect situation for me. And so I was really happy to get him there, and then. <clears throat> Um, Trent Palmer, he's been balling out in preseason, which I really liked. And I think Russell Gage just got a big injury recently. And so, you know, he was around that four or five receiver range before that injury. But now there's talks about him maybe fitting into that wide receiver three role, which is a pretty nice thing to have in terms of what the 24th pick in a draft, having a number three guy on the team that could be a big boom. <clears throat> Parker Washington is similar in that manner of, uh, <clears throat> I think that he has a big play potential. I think he's a little bit further down the depth chart. And so you know, I wouldn't be opposed, I guess, to letting him go sooner rather than later just because. Washington came out of Penn State, right? I think so, yeah. Right. So I, I'm not a lot of people are talking about him in the draft, but he showed some flashes from what I saw. I didn't watch him closely enough. But, uh, yeah, great lives of where you took them. I think Ferguson could have, like, he might not be as productive as Dalton Schultz, but he'll mm -hmm. coach you. Uh, closely, and I think at that yeah. value, you're getting some stuff out mm -hmm. of tight end that you weren't able to draft earlier. Um, a couple guys that I'll quickly point it out um, Xavier Hutchinson, I think, could easily become the number one wide receiver on the Houston Texans team. Um, that I just added CJ Stroud to, so it's kind of like um, kind of a weird stack on how I did that, but I'm, I'm really high on Xavier Hutchinson. I can do, I think he could do it all. Like, might have touched upon this on uh, when we were talking about the wide receivers, but um, he's a guy I, I would I wanted the Bears to have as like a future number one. Um, mm -hmm. But like he can easily be that on the Texans as well. They have a bright future. Um, Terrence Marshall was a flyer. Calvin Austin, I'm super high on, but the depth chart is kind of crowded right now. This is just mm -hmm. kind of like a second contract situation or like. Um, is so, something happens to where Pittsburgh lets go Deontay Johnson and Al Robinson, then something becomes interesting. Um, Tyler Coughlin was, I was surprised to get a starter that late in the draft on a team that could be really good and looking for receiving options outside of Garrett Wilson. So I was super ecstatic to have him. I've been having him on my board and I was surprised he was available this late. Um, and Trey Sermon, I'm still holding out for hope for him. Mm -hmm. um, I've been super – I'm probably the only guy who's been super high on him <laughs> among my friend circles, like in, like when he was coming out of the draft and starting for San Francisco. It didn't pan out for him. Ends up on the Eagles. And it's in a buried depth chart right now. But, like, if you look at the guys that are ahead of him, they're all either, like, satellite backs or backs that have heavy injury history. So mm -hmm. if he's able to make the roster, and that's the condition one. And then two, if – um, injury strike to Rashad Penny and um, DeAndre Swift. I can see a world where Trey Sermon is starting for the Philadelphia Eagles mm -hmm. this season. Yeah, Wild take, I, hot take, I know. But um, yeah. at the last round of the pit, pick, I'm like, at this at this stage, I rolled out like a bunch of rookies, a bunch of starters I can rely upon. If this guy pans out, then it's going to mm -hmm. solidify the rest of my roster. Yeah, I mean, like for a last round pick, I don't think that's – an awful pick, you know, I think that's pretty solid value you're getting there. Like, after this round, I think there's, I mean, I have a couple other people on my watch list that I'm like, they could be roster flyers if guys go down on my team, but um, overall, it was kind of fun just looking at all these guys that typically don't get drafted in normal leagues, you know, like Xavier Hutchinson, Terrence Marshall, Calvin Austin, uh, <clears throat> Trey Palmer, uh, you got Zach Wilson here, I guess. So. <laughs> Uh, but, yeah, no, we got a lot of guys that are no, not on normal rosters, but, you know, could develop and could kind of break out, which I think is pretty fun to see. But, you know, how do you like this uh, dynasty startup draft? What are your – I thought it was so cool. Like, um, I mean, some guys I probably would take in the last round of redraft, but not a lot of these guys. I wouldn't 
Mm-hmm. Um, I probably wouldn't be drafting Terrence Marshall or Calvin Austin too much. Um, but it's kind of cool where you get to like just watch these players grow on your roster mm-hmm. and then have that um, like have the foresight so you can pick on like second year players who like don't get that starting opportunity but like you can hold that hope that they eventually become something so i like that aspect of it and redraft is kind of like you're hoping this rookie contributes right away right this season for like a majority of the games because trying to make the playoffs within the first 13 14 games and if it doesn't pan out to like week 10 could be out of contention by then but like in dynasty you can always like trade for the future accumulate picks and all of a sudden, if you have all these rookies on your roster that start contributing like crazy, you could be competing for a championship and like have a bunch of draft picks um, in the future, which is an ideal scenario. So a lot of interesting ways you could build your roster mm-hmm. in Dynasty, and I'm excited to try this out for the first time. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, it's fun stuff. I'm excited to see how everybody pans out, especially just with all the rookies that I feel like everybody has on their rosters right now. <clears throat> But that's kind of all we have for a dynasty draft. We'll probably keep you updated on throughout the season on just maybe how some of our uh, flyers are, are panning out so far. But uh, obviously right now we got preseason going on too. And so um, that would be kind of fun just to talk about maybe some of the things you notice with preseason. I'm sure you focus a little bit more on the Bears preseason matchups. And I obviously focus a bit more on the Broncos preseason games. But um, do you have any insights on the Bears or maybe even other teams that you kind of took peeks at? Yeah, yeah, I like um, – uh, notice on those screen passes when, like, Justin Fields, like, it, it, like, blew up on the internet on Bleacher Report and, like, the Bears, like, community channels. But um, I like how Justin Fields doesn't have to, like, run for, like, 60 yards anymore, like, mm-hmm. on that. It tells me two things. They have, like, two guys on the roster right now in Herbert and um, DJ Moore that can contribute right now, get those plays going, and, like, score from anywhere. And – I always thought Herbert could do it. Like, he just didn't have the opportunity and volume to I, uh, as much as I would have liked. Um, but now that you have DJ Moore, like, I think it just solidifies that, like, he's the guy everybody has to watch out on. And, like, guys like Darnell Mooney, who's flashed a lot, and, like, Chase Claypool, who can now just function as, like, a guy who knows the offense and function in a very defined role, can, like, excel in their specific roles. And I think that helps, like, open up everything. Um, but the guy I really like from the running back room on the Bears is Roshan Johnson from what I watched. Every time I watch him, he's always, like, generating positive momentum and generating runs that should be, like, four to five yards for, like, ten yards easily. Um, like, he, he, lo- he looks like he knows how to play the game already, and that's a scary sight, like, to round out, like, a running back room where – as on the Bears, like you thought it would be Deontay Foreman and Khalil Herbert, that would be your top two backs. Um, and then like the third round, third like back is just like a development prospect that you hope can get some like four to five plays in the game, maybe contribute on special teams a ton. But I think Roshan's definitely making a case to start at some point this season, if not like halfway through this season. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. I tuned in a little bit to those Bears games. Uh, yeah, I really liked what I saw from Roshan Johnson. I think week one, he looked a little bit like he's kind of adjusting to NFL pacing, but uh, just the most recent game, I thought he looked really good. I was like, dang, he's, he might be the feature back with the Bears this, maybe not this year, but, you know, because they have Dante Foreman and Khalil Herbert, which I don't think either one will probably be a feature back long term, but. Um, yeah, I do think that that was a great value pick that they got there. Plus, yeah, I also I, everyone saw those highlight screen plays from the Bears, and <clears throat> I think that was – I mean, it was really good to see that there are playmakers to throw the ball to rather than last season. Justin Fields was the playmaker, and so uh, – I'm more impressed by the offensive line. <clears throat> like, mm-hmm. I, I mean, granted, like, they kind of give a little bit more leeway, like, on when, when the pass is thrown. Are you, like, behind the line of scrimmage or, like, within one yard? But, like, I love how aggressive and willing they are to run down the field and find blockers and seek them out. You didn't see a lot of that last season. So I'm, like, already looking and seeing some offensive line improvements. It's not perfect, but it's much better this season, and I've really been impressed with Darnell Wright as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it was good to see with the Bears, you know, especially I feel like, like we talked about in our uh, 
ranking or record prediction uh, episode that, you know, better division looks like it's going to be pretty tight. And so, you know, having it, a, having a acceptable offensive line at bare minimum is really important. I think just in terms of being the team that can take the lead basically of the division. And obviously we know that the Lions have an elite group, but um, if the bears can show that their group is heading towards elite, I think that'll be huge for maybe not this year, but at least in the next two three years, I think they could really be a staple in terms of an Eagles type or a Falcons type elite rushing team. Right. Um, speaking of, uh, speaking of like your team, the Broncos, were there any players that stood out to you? Like when you were um, watching? <clears throat> yeah. So I think a few people have probably seen the Jill McCa- Jaleel McLaughlin <clears throat> yeah, I, uh, <laughs> highlights. Okay. And, yeah, no, I think that he's an exciting player to watch. Um, I was talking with Josh a second ago. I think about, I think that I read that he was, you know, a college all-time leading rush, college football all-time leading rusher, which I think is crazy for him being undrafted. Um, but he ran really well. I thought, he's, I think, what, Tyler Batty, I think is, or Beatty, I don't know how you say it. Was I think it's Beatty. Yeah. <clears throat> Beatty was the projected number three guy, but uh, McLaughlin is looking really good right now, so that's really exciting to see. Also, Russell Wilson has looked a lot more quick and a lot more decisive in his playmaking ability, which I really liked in the moments at the Broncos offense, the starting offense is on the field. Uh, it looks a lot better than when Nathaniel Hackett was there coaching last season, uh, which makes me moderately excited. I was also really excited to see Javante Williams play uh, this last week. I know because his injury was like one of the worst types of, you know, like knee injuries you could ever get. Uh, so I was thinking maybe midway through the season, he could be looking good, but, you know, preseason week two, he's getting touches. He's breaking tackles. He's getting like eight yards of carry. He's not eight yards of carry, but he's having eight. How's yards he looking to you? Do you do you think like he's like running in a way that he could like sustain himself in the season, or uh, like how did you take a look into how he's running the ball? Yeah. Um. I mean, he looks. I mean, he has a big like brace on his leg, obviously, but right. I think he looked pretty good. I think. He was involved in like the first three or four plays of the uh, Broncos offense, which I was really surprised to that because I think uh, Sean Payton had said that, you know, they're obviously going to limit his touches the most out of the first team. And so I thought he was going to get, you know, maybe a touch here and there, but, you know, straight away they put him in. So that kind of helped, I guess, reassure me on terms of how ready he is maybe to get back into playing football, which, I was excited about, but, you know, having guys like Samaji Pirine, who's playing pretty good. Uh, you got guys like, what, Jaleel McLaughlin, who's looking good as well, which I'm pretty excited about, which uh, I think can help at least ease him if he isn't feeling 100% at the very, very beginning of the season. But he's looking really good so far, so I'm excited about that. Yeah, I think the running game is going to be a lot better for this Broncos team. Like, mm-hmm. they have, like, a lot more depth now that can, like, kind of balance, like, what they tried to do in the passing game. Mm-hmm. Um I, I think, like, when Hackett was there, they didn't have that when, like, Javante Williams went down. But, like, mm-hmm. I just also thought the frequency on where they call, like, the runs and, like, the types of runs against different spreads, like, were too predictable uh, when they called them and not enough in frequency. So I think Peyton's going to correct that. And I think for the offensive side of the ball, they're going to be a lot more smooth. It's just a matter of, like, personnel because now Tim Patrick went down. Mm-hmm. It's a sad situation to see. Um like Mims is doing something, so that's that's pretty good to see. But um, I think the overall, like operation of the Broncos' offense will be better. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, fingers crossed. Knock on wood. Break a leg. Hopefully not break a leg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> that's additionally. Are there any other preseason kind of standouts that you noticed, or guys that uh, got you excited? <laughs> Yeah, there, there's like five guys that stood out to me, to mm-hmm. be honest. So I'll probably go quick through them. Um, but they were Jordan Love, um, Desmond Ritter, um, let's see, Sam Laporta at the tight end spot, Justin Ross at the wide receiver spot, um, running backs. I talked about Roshan. So um, I think that was my running back of note I wanted to talk about. But I think particularly with the quarterbacks, like Ritter and – Love. I think you can see some similarities in how they were used. Um, like both Lafleur and um, Arthur Smith, 
uh, being from the Falcons and the, uh, sorry, Packers and Falcons respectively. Um, they kind of base their offenses like as a variant of the Shanahan system. So from what I saw in like on the throws that Ritter and Jordan Love have, it's like very ex- like as an extension of like outside zone games where you're going to have like the bootlegs, um, where he's like rolling out, moving the pocket. I saw a lot of that from Jordan Love, and I thought Jordan Love was a better operator at that than Ritter. Like, there was a nice play where I saw like Kyle Pitts being used a lot more, like on those rollouts, which is good to see because mm-hmm. like Arthur Smith seems like he found a better way to use Kyle Pitts than he did last season. Um, but like Ritter kind of like threw the ball like behind Pitts a little bit, and like Pitts made this insane one-handed grab, um, like. And this was like two yards from the line of scrimmage. Like it was just like, they, like if Pitts did not make that catch, then like any other tight end probably would have dropped it. Um, and like I think there was a fade route that Ritter threw to Drake London, that like only Drake London can get. And it was like the way I see the Falcons' offense being utilized is they're gonna lean heavily on like getting their playmakers like. Um, Obviously, B. John in the outside and inside zone running game, that's going to be a large part of what they do. So they did have one of the best rushing units in the league last season. But on the passing games, when it comes to, like, third and 12 and, like, second and long, I think you're going to see a lot of trust rows and man coverage to Pitts and London, which is what you want to see. I think there was one play, I think it was, like, a mesh call in the preseason where, like, Ritter didn't read it right. Like, he had he – had, London open for like that split second in your read, but he didn't take it and he scrambled. Um, but I love how decisive both Love and Ritter were. It was a lot of different. You didn't see any like hesitation at least in the preseason. Mm-hmm. Um, and with Love, I think he's a little less consistent than Ritter when like the drop back game because like I was watching, I think it was the Bengals and Packers preseason, unless I'm thinking of a different team where. He has a nice throw to Christian Watson down the boundary, and it's a great throw. He plays it beautifully, but like the safety made an excellent play on it, so it was incomplete. But then he has like throws where like he sees like a wide open crossing route to the tight end, and like his footwork is shoddy, and like he misses he misses the throw, and it's just, like very inconsistent. So I think you're gonna see a lot of inconsistencies from Love this season, and like you might see it from Ritter, but like I think it'll be less frequent because Ritter's a little bit more decisive to me and uses his legs, but mm-hmm. it's good to see both of them like making decisions quick. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I like both of them too. And yeah, I was actually going to talk about Jordan as well. I thought he. Oh, really? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so I, maybe that doesn't bode well for your uh, Chicago Bears. You know, if he turns out <laughs> to be another Hall of Famer for the Green Bay Packers. That would be brutal. Um, <clears throat> yeah. In addition to that, I thought Sam Howell looked pretty solid. Um, Obviously, they they broke the famous Ravens preseason win streak. <laughs> but obviously, it's what was so it crazy. like twenty three or twenty four games? In the yeah, 21? I was like twenty four games. What I, what I thought was funny about that was uh after they lost, Ravens fans were like saying, "Oh, well, why are they cheering over a preseason game?" And I'm thinking in my head, like, wasn't it the Ravens fans that were boasting their preseason win streak? But like, probably. Uh, <laughs> but that that's just me. He was yeah, but I thought Howell looked pretty good. Um, and then there's a few kind of other surprises that I saw. Um, I think one of them's I think his name's Nathan Rourke, the uh, Jaguars backup quarterback. Uh, okay. I think I think it was him who had like these just random, you know, breaking couple sacks to make the make a completion for a pretty nice game type plays. And I'm like, if this was Patrick Mahomes, this is like on ESPN for the next year, you know, that's, that was the type of plays he's making. And then additionally, uh, Aiden O'Connell, he is the, uh, Raiders rookie that, um, he was, you know, drafted pretty late. I didn't think much of him when he first got drafted, but, um, he's had a really good preseason. He's literally been quite flawless this preseason, which, uh, is not good for me as a Broncos fan, but (laughs) I, I wouldn't be surprised if he gets some playing time this year, especially just with, you know, Jimmy Garoppolo's injury history, um, which would be good for my fantasy team though, because um, regard, despite him being a Raider, uh, I still drafted him because I'm hoping that he's, so hopefully he's like good, but not good when I, when he plays the Broncos. <clears throat> but anyways, 
Um, some other things that I liked was, I mean, the Saints backfield looked pretty good. Uh, Kendry Miller, you know, finally scored a touchdown. I know he had like that little injury scare, but you know, he seems he's like he seems like he's fine. Plus, Alvin Kamara is there. Plus, uh, Jamal Williams is there. So it's like you got guys there. You're chilling for at least this year in terms of running back play. They looked good. Um, and then another oh, another running back that uh in addition to Roshan that I liked was Tate Bigsby. He's also on the Jaguars. Mm-hmm. Uh he looked really, really good. He is definitely gonna be the number two for the Jaguars behind Travis Etienne. And, and I think the coaches have actually said that they're hoping to get him a pretty big role into this offense, just at least to change up things with Travis Etienne, which I think will be what good do you think his role would be? Like do you do you think it's like more between the tackles or like is he still was he used in the passing game at all? Uh, I don't remember too much about the passing. I know like he was getting like 70 yard rushing games or what, something along those lines. Like he was, you know, he's a pretty solid, like in between the tackles type runner from what it looks like. And I mean, his name's okay. Tank Bigsby. I feel I'm gonna trust that guy, you know, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> any running back that, that's named Tank. He I sounds like trust. an interior rusher. Yeah. But I mean, he's, he looked really good. He was a guy that I wanted for my team, but I think he was drafted like, Again, it was just before I, wa- I was going to take him. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, these oh, these guys are too smart. <laughs> but <laughs> he was good there. Um, I feel like Quentin Johnston has looked really good this preseason. He's really looked good as a route runner. That was my big knock on him coming in uh, really? as a rookie okay. was <clears throat> Quentin Johnston. Yeah, his route running ability. I thought his route tree was pretty limited, similar to DK Metcalf. But, um, <clears throat> and like, yeah, DK Metcalf and Kenny Galladay, I guess, in terms of, you know, being a physical player is really important. And being able to win those 50-50 balls, I think, was really important for those two players. And so that's what I was worried about with Quentin, John- Quentin Johnston. But he seems like he's actually running routes pretty well in this Chargers offense, um, which has been a pleasant surprise for me. And I think he'll probably be a good receiver. Um, but, yeah, I think those are, for the most part, like a lot of the preseason winners that I have. Okay. Um, just a quick question on Quinton Johnson. Like, um, how's his like? Uh, have, uh, one of my knocks on him was his catching ability. Probably not his route running. I thought he was like really inconsistent with his hands and the drop like layup throws. Um, that like, I think just limited his upside. So I didn't have him one. I had Majibba, um, mm-hmm. JSN number one um, mm-hmm. because of that. But did you notice anything like any differences like in his um, catching ability? Did it seem like natural? Um, like, were there a lot of balls on the ground or, like, he was catching them all? Yeah, I mean, I I think it was just high, mostly highlights. I didn't really catch the full game for him, unfortunately, so I okay. just saw, like, highlights plus just a little bit of the game. But from what I saw, he looked really good. And so, I mean, like, in, in what you were saying about his catching ability, I think it was the fact that I didn't think he was that strong of a route runner Okay. to rely on his hands was my big worry. Right. It's like, right. he can't run routes – at an elite level is what my thought was. Plus, he didn't have the elite hands, which I thought was the receiver doomed for failure. Mm-hmm. But uh, it seems like he can actually run routes pretty well. Okay. And obviously, in that offense, he's going to be the number three guy behind Keenan Allen and Mike Williams, which he's not going to be. You know, he's getting time to basically become like Devontae Adams in terms of he can develop for a minute before he really needs to show up and actually be, you know, the guy that people expect a first round receiver to be. Right. You listed a lot of great, great guys there. Um, mm. I, I'm going to talk about guys I'm, like, really excited about because, like, I was so happy to see Justin Ross in the field, like, in mm. preseason. I think a lot of people written him off, like, written him off. At, <laughs> can't even talk. It's all English. Uh, it's English <laughs> that I can't grasp. But written him off um, over the past year. Um, and, like, the injuries he's had at Clemson and then, like, his first year, like, in Kansas City is just awful to, off to hear about like and it seems like he's like on track to be like comeback player of the year like as a second year player like how he's playing um like i just noticed like all the separation like he's had like in the, i was watching a lot of like the saints game tape when i was seeing him but like he's like running like separation and like stop routes like a number one wide receiver and that just really fascinates me i wanted him on like like the 10th round of my dynasty just to go back to the draft uh, mm-hmm. Didn't have it on my, on my team. Would have loved it. But just to see him be able to do that, like, and 
hear like Patrick Mahomes' his dad and Patrick Mahomes talking lonely about him like so much to the point where like it seems like Patrick Mahomes trusts him. Like he's a guy I would not be surprised if he's a number one wide receiver on that team, even though like Kelsey mm-hmm. is like the number one option. Like mm-hmm. Kelsey is like a wide receiver and how he's used, but like from the actual like position name, like Ross, like I think could be like the secondary option mm-hmm. Kelsey. Um mm-hmm. like that's a ceiling immediately. Um so I w- I was glad to see him and then I didn't really catch so many games of like Laporta. I, it's been like training camp, like uh, like tidbits that I really like. I really liked how well he's like separating for a tight end and like running routes that like wide receivers would towards the boundary to fetch bowls in the goal line. Um, I think he's gonna be a, like a safety blanket plus for Jared Goff coming out of the season. So like even though he's a rookie, rookies don't tend to like very well. Um, but I'm super excited about him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I heard a lot of good stuff about him and Kincaid out of camp and some just other things. Right, he's another guy I'm excited about too. <clears throat> yeah, and one last thing in terms of preseason for me at least is I just remembered um, Cowboys backfield's looking really good right now. Um, Deuce Vaughn, remember I saw him in like training camp, but I'm like people were kind of making fun of him how small he is, and I mean he is a small guy, but um, <clears throat> I mean he's pl- he's looking really good in preseason. I know the big highlight play for him is the. Uh, one arm, arm tackle that he broke, which I don't think was that great. But the week before, he played really good. Overall, he played really good. Plus, Rico Dottle, uh, the other back, looking like uh, the number two guy for the Cowboys backfield is also looking really well. And so the fact that the Cowboys, despite losing Zeke, are seem three deep in terms of running backs uh, seems really good for them. And maybe it'll help, you know, Dak Prescott not throw 15 interceptions in 12 games this upcoming season, but... Oh, um, I hope not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, overall, that was really that was really cool to see. Plus, obviously, you have, I don't know, Cowboys always seem like they have star talent, so we'll just see how they do. But that's all I got. They for could them. trade for a star, cool. like maybe an RB <clears throat> from the Colts. Um, there's been a yeah. lot of trade rumors <laughs> circulating around Jonathan Taylor. Uh-huh. Is the Cowboys the def- uh, destination for him? Um, that, that seems like a plausible one. I would, I would do it if I'm a Cowboys fan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, like, yeah, but at the same time, it's like, I'd almost want to see what I got for the full season of Pollard because I mean, he looks like he's good. Plus I, I do like the backups. I'm really high on them right now, <clears throat> but, um, I know the big talk has been like the Miami dolphins as a destination for him. Um, if he does go to the dolphins, how, how would you feel about your uh, dynasty running back selections that you took in the same? Way? Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't feel too great, honestly. <laughs> uh, I mean, like I might make a deal for a chain um, if, if if it was me, um, just because there's always like a concern for injury, and I think he'll be mm-hmm. like knocked down like several pegs if this move happens because it's like, oh, there's no path for him to become the starter right now, so there's no reason for us to consider him. Um, mm-hmm. but. Like, as far as, like, the Dolphins, um, like, offense, that would just, like, they're already, like, a playoff team, like, whenever two was on the field. Like, mm-hmm. well, they have one of the most, like, efficient, like, explosive offenses when two was on the field. Passing to, like, the behemoth, like, wide receiver number one duos with Hill and Waddle. And then if you add, like, Jonathan Taylor to that mix, like, it's just, like, what do you do? Because, like, Jonathan Taylor can do it all. Like, Raheem Mostert's fast. Like, Jeff Wilson's fast. Mm-hmm. Um, and like the outside zone game, like complements them well to use those speed abilities. But like Jonathan Taylor can run gap zone, like equally as well at an elite level. He could break for seventy from anywhere. So like now on like the Dolphins team, if he's on there, like you have three guys that can break for a seventy yard gain at any point of time. They become instantly as explosive as the Chiefs or the Eagles, which which is like insanely scary to see. So like I mean. If I'm Miami, I'm making a push for this because, like, already you're trying to bank on two of remaining healthy. Why not bank on Jonathan mm-hmm. Taylor adding another dimension where you don't mm-hmm. have to lean on two as much? Like, he's going to give you an explosive plays from the backfield itself. And then, like, like you're telling the Bills and the Jets, like, good luck trying to stop this. Yeah. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, I mean, yeah, overall, I do think that would be a pretty nasty fit for them there. Uh, I know it's a joke I've seen the Jets as an option for Jonathan Taylor, 
<clears throat> in terms of just seeing people with stocks in uh, Jets running backs just absolutely losing it in terms of their guys absolutely losing all their value for this season. But, <clears throat> I mean, I don't think that uh, he will be going to the Jets. I mean, I feel like it'd be kind of weird to bring Jonathan Taylor after you got Dalvin Cook, you got Brees Hall, you got Israel Benacombe. Oh, they're, they're not, the Jets are not getting Jonathan Taylor. <clears throat> Yeah, but the one thing actually I did see with the Jets at least was potentially doing a trade with Dalvin Cook plus picks to go for Jonathan Taylor. And I'm like, I mean, if that's the case that you're going for, I mean, I wouldn't be opposed to it. I mean, he's then the Colts still have a running back to play, you know, but then. Uh, yeah, but it doesn't make too much of sense on the Colts' side. Like, because you're, you're simply trying to get an older back mm -hmm. and then trade and, and then like gain more assets, but like. With the way the running back position is being devalued right now, mm -hmm. like if you're getting Dalvin Cook, you're probably not getting a first round pick with that. If you're the Colts side, mm -hmm. you're probably getting like a third round pick, like if not lower for sure. So like, yeah. Well, I think like yeah. in either case, like the Jets just don't make sense because they already have like a future back like Brees Hall mm -hmm. that has the potential to be as good as Jonathan Taylor, but he started out on like bad history, like with injuries already. So. Yeah. Like, like they're banking on him being healthy, and I think like uh, getting Dalvin Cook as an insurance plan so you can manage Brees Hall mm -hmm. was like their approach. So that's mm -hmm. why I kind of like just saying, yeah. okay, I don't definitely don't think they're going for Jonathan Taylor. Yeah. Well, I mean, like in terms of the Taylor trade, I don't think that he, they will be getting a first round in return for Jonathan Taylor. I mean, you look at right. other elite running backs that get traded and like. Like, second-round pick seems like the very peak value that you can get for it, you know? And so I don't think regardless but if you're looking, if you're looking at the Colts' as asking price, they're like, okay, we want a first-round pick for him. <clears throat> or we want, like, picks that, like, add up, like a collection mm -hmm. of picks that add up to the value of a first-round pick. I don't think they'll get it at that price because mm -hmm. the way the market is being valued. But, like, if you're if you're getting Dalvin Cook, I, you're definitely not getting, like, the picks that equate to first-round value because – Dalvin Cook is a guy that's going to be there for three years at minimum, right? So. Yeah, but yeah, I guess the one thing, I guess, for the Colts is like, in a way, I'd almost want to value at least a good running back now if you're starting Anthony Richard right away, just because that's a nice safety blanket to have for a very raw rookie quarterback. And I'm, I just feel like, I mean, if they, I think they should, I mean, hopefully they stick with, Jonathan Taylor, but like hypothetically in a world that they lose Jonathan Taylor, it's like, is, who, is, are you going to, I know Zach Moss, he's going to be out a couple weeks this year. So you're going to roll with what, like Dion Jackson as your, uh, and like Evan Hull or whatever as your main, I guess, safety blanket options for Anthony Richardson. And it's like, and he's, no one's going to, you know, be eyeing it or like stacking the box for your running back at that stage. And everybody's going to be keying on your quarterback in terms of, like you know, option plays and you know, and so I think that I I don't I don't think this is the case. I don't think they'll be going for Dalvin Cook, but I'm just saying, like hypothetically, I guess there's a situation or there's a universe where it does make sense in terms of a, a veteran running back that has elite receiving upside that can play for a couple of years while Anthony Richardson develops. Then you ship him out, draft a young rookie guy three years from now after Richardson kind of settles in as a quarterback and then you move from there as a contender i mean i i know the Bengals are i i don't remember if they extended burrow yet or not mm -hmm. but they have 19 million in cap space right now um i don't know if they're trying to save it up for a burrow extension or like a higgins mm -hmm. extension mm -hmm. um but i there's a world where i could see them trading mixon mm -hmm. or jonathan taylor even though they took chase brown in the draft mm -hmm. and really going for it all and i could see them like and it ended up putting a stronger offer, like yeah. with a better, uh, with like a bet, like I would say he's better than Dalvin Cook. I, I, I think he's a better like talent. They're comparable talents, and it's like by skin of teeth, like comparisons. Mm -hmm. But like Joe Mixon could do a lot of the things that Dalvin Cook can do. Mm -hmm. Um, and like on that Colts team, like I think he could still be there for like two or three more years. Um, you're getting him on the cheap if you're the Colts. So, uh, so like that's a that's a good sign, and then like uh, the Bengals, of course, you want Jonathan Taylor because like it's another piece that keeps you on par with the Kansas City Chiefs, and then could be the missing piece that keeps you over the top. 
So um, I, I would look at the teams with the most cast base. Like mm-hmm. Browns are a little bit tougher because they, I think they already have Nick Chubb. I don't think they want to like split carries that that side. Panthers also make sense. Like they have not 19 mm-hmm. million. Um, but like those are like legit, like the only teams above the Colts in terms of cast base. So it's mm-hmm. definitely a weird situation. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And I don't think, I think they put a deadline on the trade for like the 29th or something like that. And so right, right. I'm assuming by next week, some point, well, it's like six days from now. So next week ish, we'll kind of see how it develops. Um, and I'll kind of, I guess, share our thoughts there for that. But I think that's about all we have for now, at least. Um, any last thoughts? Or- uh, no, I, I enjoy this. I enjoy talking about our rosters, like players, like um, like our strategies, and then also like mm-hmm. players are really high on from like the preseason and also like who we're keeping tabs on throughout the season or like even like seasons beyond that. I think it's important to know like players like you should keep an eye on, like whether they're doing drafts right now or whether you're just like curious about like players in general. I think it's always exciting to talk about the guys that could be the next Jamar Chase, next Nick Chubb, like those, those like like the next Patrick Mahomes. Like I think Richardson could be like really good. Like we didn't even talk about him. I'm like some of the almost throws he had to Pierce and like the crazy athletic ability he has. Um, I thought he re- looked really good in preseason. So it's always nice to talk about these guys. Um, we hope you enjoyed this podcast um, and listening to us. Like this is kind of the format, how we want to go, like as we cover games um, and now that we've gone through each division, each like player ranking system, and we can really dissect into the games more and talk about what we see, what to pay attention to and what it means for the future. Mm-hmm. Yep. But so yeah, that's all we got for today. But remember to follow us on our Instagram at, Amon.a.mission for the stuff. Well done, Corsian. Well, well done. <clears throat> yep. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. But yeah, just for updates in general, um, we're trying to post, we're trying to get around to posting more content on there besides, hey, we got a new video up. But um, yeah, so stay tuned, see what we got. We're trying to post a little bit of reels, maybe, maybe just kind of a little more like informative stuff that we pull from some of these podcasts here. But um, yep. That's all we got for today, so peace out. Peace, guys.